Pedro, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's your first time in Morocco, right? Yes, uh, first time. I'm enjoying it a lot, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. Um, so, Pedro, you are uh, currently the chief of staff to the chairman uh, of the Brazilian Center of International Relations, which is the main Brazilian think tank, um, you know, that is interested in foreign affairs. Um, and that is also going to play a prominent role during the next G20. Maybe you can touch on this. But I wanted to ask you what your role actually is at the center. Yeah, so um, like you said, I am a director at the Brazilian Center for International Relations. The acronym is SEBRI. In Portuguese, stands for Centro Brasileiro de Relações Internacionais. And my role at SEBRI is um, supporting the team and the leadership and the board of trustees in whatever contacts and partnerships that our think tank has with other partners, be it you know, governments, be it um, the foreign diplomats, embassies, consulates, companies. We have a huge board of corporate members um, and also all kinds of international interactions that we have with philanthrop philanthropies, um, other think tanks. We are part of a number of networks, including uh, uh, a long time um, partnership with the Policy Center for the New South. So it's it's a busy job, but I'm lucky to count on a great team, and I also have a great leadership uh, that, that is guiding us through key moments, such as uh, the G20 presidency that Brazil has already uh, received from, from, uh, from India, and we're very excited about it. We think it's going to be something like a milestone for Brazilian foreign policy at large, and of course, for civil society and, and think tanks like ours. Some people have compared the, the energy that uh, Brazil is currently putting in its foreign policy with the organization of the G20. Brazil was also supposed to host uh, the next BRICS summit in 2024, then the COP30 in 2025. Some people are comparing it to the moment that Brazil experienced when it welcomed the Olympics and the World Cup. Would you think the parallel is valid? I think it's an interesting comparison. There, there are a lot of... Um, aspects that do uh, have similarities. Um, back in those days, it was a moment of great optimism uh, about Brazil within our borders and also outside. Um, and, and it is true to say that we were able to um, take advantage of a number of uh, legacies. Truth is that for a number of other different reasons, complex reasons, complex reasons um, the country went through a particularly hard period during and after those very moments, um, an economic recession, the most serious we've ever had, a huge political crisis that we're still uh, parsing through. Um, and now, uh, after this uh, intense moment, let's put it that way, uh, it is fair to say that Brazil is coming back. So the parallel makes sense. Of course, there are a number of different uh, aspects that are relevant. So the World Cup, and the Olympics, they're all uh, mass phenomena, right? So you'll have dozens and, and thousands of people uh, from very different profiles coming to a number of different cities in Brazil. When it comes to the G20 or COP30 or the BRICS summit, uh, the audience and the kind of tourism we're going to receive, it's a bit more uh, focused. It's a narrow profile of people, so you're going to have thousands of journalists, thousands of investors, thousands of foreign diplomats, but that's about it, right? Uh, so that demands that the cities that are going to host the G20 events, just such as Rio, Brasilia, uh, they had to be prepared not only to host in, in an adequate way, but to make the most of the potential legacy that's going to come out of those meetings. And we are, uh, when I say that I do take care of partnerships that we have with other uh, parts uh, of the Brazilian foreign policy ecosystem, we are in very good contact with many of the cities that are uh, going to host uh, those events. And we are in partnership, including with the government, the federal government, uh, on that. So for us, it's definitely going to be a milestone. And it's inevitable for us to look back in periods when Brazil was more on the agenda, on the world agenda, and take inspiration. Yes. Uh, President Lula played a huge role, you know, in the new prominence that uh, Brazil enjoyed in the end of the 2000s and early 2010s. He was a very popular president at the end of his second mandate. 
um, he played a role in trying to reframe multilateralism. Uh, he enjoyed support from France, notably very vocal support in favor of Brazil becoming a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Um, and now he's back, right? Um, he tried to play a mediating role between Russia and Ukraine. Some compared it with the mediating role he also tried to play with Iran um, in the early 2010s. Uh, but at the same time, because of reasons that you mentioned, political polarization at home, uh, you know, corruption scandals, uh, uh, the taper tantrum uh, in the mid-2010s, uh, but also because maybe the commodity boom that helped fund a lot of his policies is over, maybe doubt that he actually has the necessary and the required energy and steam to match his ambition. What do you think about that? It is true that um, Lula played a great role especially during the latter half of his first time in government in shaping a potential of leadership for Brazil. It is also true that, you know, you know <laughs> Brazil is different from 10 years ago. Lula is, is himself a different person. He's older, he spent time in prison. Um, and <laughs> I don't need to tell you how the world has become more different over the past uh, years. I would say, though, that if I look at the set of assets, foreign policy assets, that Brazil can count on when trying to play those roles that you suggested, and a number of others, uh, I particularly don't think that mediating roles uh, in, in a conflict such as the one of the Russian invasion of Ukraine should be the focus of Brazilian foreign policy. I would br much rather they uh, would put their energy and the overwhelming uh, percentage of their efforts uh, in curbing climate change, for instance, that we've been doing a great job on that. Uh, but considering all of these global issues, I do think that Brazil still has the majority of the foreign policy assets that it can count on. So, um, so we don't have a lot of hard power. Our military is just uh, for our own self-defense purposes, and um, we don't have. Uh, we're not a nuclear power. In fact, uh, Brazil is the only country among those countries that George Kennan named the monster countries, like huge population, huge territory, huge economies, that uh, not only does not have a strong military, does not have a, nu uh, a nuclear uh, uh, structure, and we don't even want to have that kind of nuclear um, agenda. So whatever assets that we have, and I do think we have them, we, we, we draw them from our, the, our soft power, from the power of our example, uh, our allegiance to the principles that were put together at the UN Charter, a, a, a document in itself that we, uh, the Brazilian diplomacy had a great role in, in shaping and writing. Um, and, and when I mean the force of our example, I say, you know, Brazil is a country with 10 uh, sovereign neighbors. So we have 10 borders with 10 different countries. And we haven't waged war against any of them for, the, for more than half a century. Um, how many countries can we think of that can say the same thing or even a similar figure, right? So that's what I mean when I say that we draw a lot of our foreign policy assets, for assets from the power of our example. Um, I would, but I would much rather if uh, Brazilian foreign policy could focus those assets uh, in the provision or protection or creation of global pu public goods such as, you know, climate mitigation, uh, climate adaptation technology, energy transition. So Brazil is by far the country with the most renewable energy matrix, at least among the G20 countries, um, and a number of other um, uh, uh, more, um, I think, more essential global public goods. So the most successful and the largest system of public vaccination in the world, the most successful and largest system of public transplants in the world, which is something which is technically hard for a developed country, a small developed country, let alone for a huge and unequal and poor country such as Brazil. So um, I'm confident with, that we can play a, a role. And of course, the President Lula, his, his persona, um, it's undeniable the level of charisma and the level of respect that he um, gets from other leaders. Um, 
to a very significant extent, he represents what the country has uh, to offer in its best um, uh, form. Yes. My last question is going to be the following. Uh, recently, um, I had a conversation with uh, a senior fellow at SEBRI who told me that if there are three countries with which Brazil uh, should have a strategy, it would be the United States, China, and Argentina, your neighbor. You also recently mentioned uh, the 10 neighbors uh, with which uh, Brazil uh, shares borders. What I wanted to ask you is how you see regional integration moving forward, notably in light of the recent outcome of the Argentinian election. Uh, at SEBRI, we have a very dear uh, member of our board of trustees who was an ambassador to Argentina. And once he told me something that quite captures uh, how Argentina is important for Brazilians. So for Brazil, or for an average Brazilian, the world starts in Argentina to the extent that it's our first immediate neighbor. So that's how relevant Argentina and Argentinian, you know, uh, Argentine culture and the people and the Argentine economy is for, for Brazil. Um, when you mention those three countries, United States, China, and Argentina, I wouldn't put it better myself. Uh, these are the, the, the three priorities. I think there are other actors. Uh, I mean, it's undeniable how relevant for Brazil and for the European, European Union, the relationship between our two um, blocks is. And I'm not only speaking about trade, but of course, that's one of the items in the agenda. Uh, we, have to, we have to pay a lot of attention. And this is something I wish we could, um, in terms of foreign policy, dedicate more of our energy uh, uh, in Africa, or at least the Portuguese-speaking Africa. I know Africa is it's an overwhelming pieces of different civilizations and countries and economies, but uh, we, we, we are uh, uh, inevitably tied to the past and the future of Africa, so we have to bear that in mind. As for the United States and China, I think that's the, that's the rule, not the exception, because every single country on earth has to think about how they deal with those two um, major partners and increasingly major, uh, major uh, rivals. Um, but as for any other country, it would also it will also uh, it would always be a priority for us to deal with our neighbors. It starts in Argentina. I'm not particularly concerned with uh, whatever uh, different policies might come out of the new government. I mean, new governments come in and out, uh, and the relationship is so much older, and there's so much more at stake that I don't I don't see Brazilian diplomacy um, accepting provocations entering into uh, uh, disputes, I think. And, and you, you could even notice that the newly formed government in Argentina, uh, they've been, especially when it comes to foreign policy and their relationship with Brazil, they've been doing some really interesting moves. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, really optimistic on that. Uh, and overall, when it comes to South America, yes, I mean, we were talking about the G20. Um, not a lot of countries in South America or Latin America are part of the G20. It's just us and Argentina and South America and Mexico up north. Uh, but I wish that the Brazilian pre presidency could make an effort uh, to at least put in the agenda the topics and challenges and opportunities for development that are more typical of South American countries. Because our challenges and opportunities, they are different from the ones that South Asia faces, different from the ones of Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, uh, needless to say, different from the European uh, challenges and opportunities. So um, Brazil, as the I don't like to use the expression natural leader of the region because it sometimes it might mean that we take it for granted. But as a country with a potential and a duty to um, play a role in, in shaping the region, uh, I think it is an opportunity and uh, a duty for us to um, make sure that the particular particularities of Latin America are put at the center of the agenda, be it the G20, uh, the UN debates, BRICS next year, we made a lot of effort to put Argentina in the bloc, uh, which I think was the right decision. Um, and just like any other country, we're going to always prioritize our region out of culture, out of economics, out of pure interest. Yeah. Pedro, thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you, my pleasure.